For anybody that's not been here before, my name's Dawn and this is Lounge Bar Crime. If I've got time at the end, I'll tell you what I've been up to, but otherwise, let's just get into this case. So when I was researching this case, the person that kept springing to mind all the time was Mallory Munro. I just couldn't stop thinking about her. It just She just reminded me of her. I think it's probably the tragedy in it. But when I got to the end of the research, I found out that there's a slight connection. So let's get into it. From a Dairy Queen in Vancouver to Hugh Hefner's Playboy Mansion in LA, things couldn't get any better for Dorothy Stratton. But when three influential men turn up in her life, it puts her in a spin and Dorothy is left not knowing which way to turn or who to trust. But let's just go back to the beginning. The year is 1977 and Dorothy Stratton, still a senior in high school, but like a lot of high school seniors, she takes a part-time job in the local Dairy Queen to help out with the family. Born in Grace Maternity Hospital in Vancouver, Canada, on February the 28th, 1960, to Simon and Nella Hoekstraten, who had emigrated from the Netherlands. Dorothy was the eldest of three children. Her brother was born a year after her, John Arthur, and her younger half-sister, eight years later in 1968, named Louise. Dorothy's father had abandoned the family when Dorothy was just three years old. Dorothy's mother remarried, but this marriage also failed. So Nellie found it quite difficult working as a nurse and bringing up three children on her own, which is why Dorothy was working in the local Dairy Queen. It's the 70s. I know some of my subscribers remember the 70s. I remember the 70s. In fact, I think I'm a year older than Dorothy. The 70s was mad. Everything was going on. It was it was just fantastic. The music was fantastic. The fashion was fantastic. Things were just changing really fast. And Dorothy had all this ahead of her. 17, working in a Dairy Queen, getting a few extra bucks. And in walks Paul Snyder. Paul Snyder walks into the Dairy Queen, takes one look at Dorothy Stratton and doesn't look back. Straight away, he sees pound signs in her. Paul Snyder was also from Vancouver. He quit school in the seventh grade after his parents split up. He worked as a leather cutter in his dad's sweatshop just for a short time before he started pursuing the high life. Paul Snyder had a distinguished look. Well, kind of. If that's possible for the 70s, because in the 70s, they wore anything. But Paul Snyder always wore like big floppy hats and the shirt open with the medallion, which was very 70s. But he'd have on like a fur, a fur coat, a mint coat over it. He'd always have like these, like I said, these floppy hats. And he was always very, he, he stood out. He wasn't, he was no plain Jane. Now, when he went into the Dairy Queen, all the young girls in there knew him because he'd been in there before and they'd all kind of worked him out. And they warned Dorothy, stay clear of him. However, it wasn't a case of what Dorothy wanted. Paul Snyder had made his mind up. He was going to pursue Dorothy and that's what he did. I think it's fair to say that Paul Snyder flew by the seat of his pants he didn't do the nine to five. He didn't, you know, get up and he didn't have any planned or set life or any kind, anything organised in his life. He promoted nightclubs during the day or sold cars, flash cars. He always drove a flash car as well. And at night, he was a pimp. So... He also, when I said before, he, he wore this medallion, he used to wear this medallion. It was actually not, it wasn't a medallion. It was the Star of David. And he was, because of this Star of David, he was known around town as the Jewish pimp. So you see, he had this reputation and these, all these young girls in the Dairy Queen, they knew that. All the young girls about town knew that as well. Paul Snyder saw women as a commodity. He never saw them for who they were. He looked at them and he saw dollar signs. And that's what it was for Paul Snyder. What can you give me? How much can you earn me? So he didn't have to do his selling of cars during the day. That's how he went about life. What can, what can you do for me? 
how much can you make me so I don't have to go out and sell these cars. I can just drive around in one and you can pay for it. That was Paul Snyder. Dorothy Stratton on the other hand, she was, she was brought up on a farm. She was 17. She was still really, really young. Paul Snyder, by the way, was 10 years her senior. But I mean, she wasn't even a girl about town where she saw things. She wasn't. She was getting ready to go to a senior prom. She just ha didn't ha really have any life skills, to be fair. She went to school. She went to the Dairy Queen and earned money and helped out with the family. And she went home and she did her studies. And that was her life. So Snyder kept coming in and out the Dairy Queen, trying to impress Dorothy. And it's what he did. And he knew that the other girls were warning her off and telling her to stay away from him. But... He impressed her. She thought it was fantastic. And in the end, he got to take her out. He spoiled her. He took her to all the best restaurants, bought her dresses, handbags, shoes. He knew how to do it. He knew what he was doing. She didn't have a clue. He was, I can't say the word on YouTube, but he was working on her. Let's put it that way. Let's call it that. She felt that he was protective over her and everybody else was trying to explain to her he's not protective, he's controlling, but she wouldn't have it. The relationship was just gaining momentum. No matter what anybody said, she carried on seeing him. And then he tried to persuade her because the opportunist that he is and seeing get rich quick signs all around her head, he thought, right, he tried to persuade her to have some new photographs taken and he brought in this photographer. At first, she was, no way, I'm not doing that. And, you know, I don't want to do it. He convinced her, like you know he would. He convinced her to do it, which she did. She was really shy and it just wasn't her, it just wasn't her thing at all. But he got her there and she did it. He sent these photographs in to Playboy magazine of which they was interested, but they did feel that she was quite young. Now, they wanted to invite her over to LA, but they did say that they wanted her age and they wanted, if she was underage, which she was, that they needed her parents' signature. See, that's what it was like in the 70s. That wouldn't wash now. It, it wouldn't matter how many parents' signatures now, but then, yeah, just get your mother, and people would just get anybody to sign anything. I mean, I was the same. I was working in a pub at 17, telling them I was 18. They made me manager within a couple of months and I was only 17. <laughs> but it was different in them days. You could do that. You could just walk in somewhere and say, yeah, that's how old I am. And anyway, it said that he forged the signature, but I've also read that he persuaded her mother. By the way, he'd met her mother who wasn't quite happy with him at first. Uh, or Dorothy seeing him with him being a, a lot older. I mean, 17, 10 years on a 17 year old, they're your learning years, they count them years. So she wasn't too happy, but he, he convinced her, he just kept going round there and eventually she gave in. Of course, you know, he could see that he was buying her daughter all these things. So yeah, she just went with it. So by the summer of 78, Dorothy, had her invite to go across to LA. Now, so nervous. She'd never even been anywhere before. She'd never been on a, an aeroplane before. She gets there really, really nervous, frightened to death, actually. And they're taking these photographs and they could see that she was out of her depth. Every two minutes as well, she was on the phone to Paul telling him what was going on. Obviously, they were getting a bit cheesed off with this, thinking, who, who is this guy? They're trying to get her to do this, to do that. They had to tell her every move to make. And she, she was out of her depth. They could see that she was out of her depth. But what they felt was, was that she had a lot of potential and they didn't want to let her go. So they offered her a job at Century City Bunny Club in LA. But because she was underage, she wasn't allowed to sell alcohol. So she could be a hostess. 
So they added near the door meeting and greeting customers as they come in, which they were really pleased with that. There was no way that they was going to let her go back because she was so stunning. And yeah, things started to roll for her from there. So also in the summer of 1978 was the 25th anniversary for the Playboy Bunny Hunt. Everybody thought she was going to win. But the they just felt that she wasn't ready. She still wasn't ready. and She was still learning her way. She'd literally been there months and she went there naive without a clue. So they still think, they still felt that she had a way to go yet. And she actually lost out to a girl called Candy Loving. Just a side note on that, Candy Loving, I thought that that was her bunny name and just did a bit of research on her. But her name was actually Candice Bunny. Uh, Candice Loving, that was her real name. Just a thought, anyway, I just thought <laughs> I'd mention that. Well, that's a good name, isn't it, for a bunny? <laughs> anyway, so she lost out to Candy, Candy Loving. But also at this time, of course, Paul Snyder had packed his little backpack and got over there because he wanted to be part of the party. He wanted to muscle in. He wanted to be part of this crew. This was the way of life he wanted. This is what he'd been looking for. And this is how he lived in Canada with his flash cars and acting like he was somebody when actually he, he wasn't anybody. He was living off women for the best part of it. But yeah, he went over there and tried to make it known that he was her manager to everybody. It didn't go down well. People were just like trying to push him aside. Hugh Hefner did not like him at all. The other bunnies, her friends, nobody liked him. They all told her, this guy is too controlling. And it was like, no, so her, to her, you see, she felt that she wouldn't be there without him. And the thing with Dorothy was, she really was a good soul. She actually really did believe that all these opportunities, okay, he took photographs and sent them off and she got there and probably no, she wouldn't have got there because she would never have done these photographs without him. So yeah, he did put her on that path. However, how do you know that another talent spotter wouldn't have spotted her and, and done something similar or better or just as good? We don't know that. But in her mind, she felt she owed everything to Paul and her, her loyalties to Paul was really, really strong. She wouldn't listen to anything. I think she felt that they didn't understand that he was a really, really good guy. And that's was in her head. But she's looking from a naive point of view. So these people in LA, they'd seen all this before. It was nothing new to them. They'd seen these hangers on and these people that pushed the way through off the backs of other people. The thing was, while Paul Snyder was now in LA, he was going to Hefner's mansion. He was going to all these parties. By the way, all the presents stopped to Dorothy. Roles had now reversed because she had an apartment now in LA. So of course he was living there. He didn't have the green card to work or anything. So he was obviously living off her. So the roles, everything had reversed just as he'd planned. Cash signs the minute he saw her in the Dairy Queen. So Paul Snyder, he got an inkling that Dorothy's friends and Hugh Hefner and his entourage didn't like him, but he wasn't going anywhere. He was gadding about the Hugh Hefner's mansion like he owned the place and Dorothy was just rolling with it. But the thing was, Dorothy was getting more well known. She was getting recognised. She was getting serious money. She was doing very, very well for herself. And with this, Paul plung even tighter to her. He wasn't, he wasn't going back to Canada. He wasn't going nowhere. He was staying at exactly where he was. The only thing is, he got a little bit too 
complacent, should we say, in the mansion. And he was caught messing about with some of the other Playboy bunnies. With this, Hugh Hefner's entourage threw him out. And Hugh Hefner said, the only time you're allowed in here is when you're actually with Dorothy. See, he was just going backwards and forth just as he felt. He wasn't even bothered about being with Dorothy because he had other things on his mind. He, he just wanted to live the life. But when she was doing other things, when she was on assignments and doing different jobs, he was going to the Playboy Mansion and having a little mess about here and there. He had this feeling that his time there was going to be short-lived. So he had to do something. So what did he do? He played his ace card and he got down on bended knee and proposed to Dorothy. Everybody was shocked that nobody wanted to know. It was just like, no, no, just don't do this. But to her, this was the guy that she loved. I think she was pulled. Well, she was pulled. I don't think she was pulled from pillar to post. She had all these other bunnies that was knew the game and was trying to say to her, look, you know, this ain't going to last. This guy's controlling. We've had all this. We've had these guys around us. You need to get rid. Even though you Hefner and all the Playboy bunnies and Dorothy's new friends were against the marriage, Dorothy Stratton married Paul Snyder in June 1979. But 1979 became a massive year for Dorothy. She started making TV appearances and she started getting TV roles. Also in August, 1979, Dorothy was named Miss August Playboy Bunny of the Month. With all this came confidence. This is the time that Dorothy should have really told Paul Snyder to go. Obviously, she was meeting influential people, film stars, celebrities, directors. One of those directors was Peter Bogdanovich, who was really impressed with Dorothy. And he offered her a role in the film, They All Laughed. So by March 1980, she was on her way to the Big Apple, New York, to start filming They All Laughed with Audrey Hepburn and John Ritter. Now it's said that this film is kind of based slightly around Dorothy Stratton and Paul Snyder's relationship. However, Paul Snyder was getting really controlling now and he was getting very jealous. He didn't want her to go. He was packing his bags. He was ready to go with her. He was doing anything he could. You stay here and you just keep doing what you're doing and pay my bills. This is what he wanted. He didn't want to risk her being out of his sight. Obviously, she wasn't gonna let that opportunity go. And she kind of liked Peter. She got on with him and yeah, so, Dorothy just started to pack a case and she was going to the Big Apple without Paul. Paul wasn't having her. He said that he was going to go with her. Now, the thing is, Dorothy had started just getting a few feelings for Peter Bogdanovich. It, nothing had happened between them or anything like that, but she was growing up. So what she told Paul was that Peter Bogdanovich had, it was a closed cast. It was just crew and cast only, which was a lie. But it was the only way that she could keep Paul at home, so that Paul Snyder, so that she could go start filming. And she wanted to see how she got on with somebody else, obviously, Peter Bogdanovich. So after a lot of persuasion, Paul Snyder decided to stay in LA, but he did have every reason to worry because as the months went on with Dorothy and Peter Bogdanovich, they did start becoming closer. You see, he wasn't toxic. The only real, she'd only had one boyfriend by the way, before Paul Snyder, just a young, a young lad. And so the only real long relationship that she'd had was with Paul Snyder. But Peter Bogdanovich, he wasn't 
toxic like Paul. He was calm. He was encouraging. They got on. The relationship was smooth. It was just easy. A few months before the end of shooting, they all laughed in New York with Peter Bogdanovich. Dorothy heard an announcement from Hugh Hefner that Dorothy Stratton had won Playmate of the Year 1979. Remember the year before, she wasn't ready. Well, bunnies, Playboy bunnies can be there for years and never get that title. Well, many of them are. And she'd literally gone the year before and missed it because she, she had the potential, but she didn't have the experience. Whereas now, you Hefner felt she did have the experience. This meant that she had to come back from New York to go on a publicity tour for the Playbo Playmate of the Year 1979 with, for Hugh Hefner. So she had to say goodbye to Peter Bogdanovich just for a short time. But it was then that she realised she didn't want to go back. She didn't want to leave him. And she realised then that her feelings were changing. She knew that when she left New York and she had to go back to LA, she knew that this meant she would probably see Paul Snyder again. He would be there and waiting for her. And of course he was. At the launch party for this Playmate of the Year, they did like a big event for it. Hugh Hefner got up and said like a, a, a lot of nice words about Dorothy and he really went over the top, probably knowing that Paul Snyder would hear all this. And then he handed the microphone to Dorothy and it was Dorothy's time to say a few words. And she thanked everybody, including you, Hefner. She thanked everybody, but she didn't mention Paul. She didn't give Paul Snyder a mention at all. And I think this shows the turning point for her as well. At the end of the launch party that evening, she went on The Tonight Show uh, with Johnny Carson. And from there, she had to think about going on the tour. For the last two weeks of the tour, it was going to end up in Vancouver, in her hometown. So she was really looking forward to that. So she just thought, right, I'm just going to get on with this. At least at the end of this tour, I'm going to see my family and then I can get back to see Peter. Just at the end of this tour and just before she was going to Vancouver, she had a few days spare in between. So she jumped on a plane to New York to see Peter Bogdanovich. And I think it was at that time that she realised that it was done with her and Paul. She was sick of this toxic marriage that she she was in. She, she learned what a toxic relationship was. She learned what a controlling relationship was. She now knew the difference between something running smoothly and nicely to something that Paul Snyder was offering her. On her way back, after leaving Peter, she's on her way back to go to Vancouver, to her hometown. And while she's en route, she writes a letter to Paul Snyder to say, look, I want you to give me more freedom within this marriage, which we knew what that meant. But I suppose she wasn't asking for a divorce. She was just... I suppose she wanted what he was doing and to her there was somebody real in front of her so she wanted to pursue that however when she arrived at her mum's house she was so shocked because Paul Snyder was sat there waiting for her the big arms open pleased to see her you see by going to her mother's and being there for when Dorothy turned up that was his biggest mistake, really. That was his first mistake. Paul Snyder's first mistake. What he should have done was, he should have accepted that offer because he could have just stayed in LA. There was only one way for Paul and that was his way. But instead of accepting that offer and saying, okay. By the way, Dorothy didn't mention that she was seeing Peter Bogdanovich, but she didn't have to. Paul Snyder could see through the lines. He knew exactly what was going on. But like I said, he was doing the same. So what he should have done was said, fair enough. And then at least he would have got a little bit of what he wanted. The other thing that he did was, 
as well. He, when she got to Vancouver, she had a couple of days with her family, little sister, younger brother, mum. He booked her in to a load of nightclubs that he'd set up. Again, I'm her manager and took her out every evening to do all these appearances where she was getting big bucks. He was collecting all that money and putting it in his back pocket. And she went. She went. Now, Dorothy slipping back into the old Dorothy. She took a look at Paul, shoving money in his back pocket, getting her to do this, that and the other. And she made him another offer. And this was mistake number two for Paul. She told Paul that she was willing to give up all this acting and everything and go back to Canada, go back to Vancouver with Paul and work on the marriage. No, he didn't want her to give up acting. He wanted her to carry on acting. Because she was his meal ticket. Don't, oh, listen, I don't want you to go anywhere. I just don't, you know, I just need you to just be there Go out to work and bring the money home for this apartment in LA that we've got. You pay for everything and, you know, I can carry on living here and doing what I want. No, no love. Don't give up acting. Now, you know, when I first read that, I thought to myself, why would she give up acting? And then I thought, I wonder if she was calling his bluff knowing that he wouldn't want her to do that. Had she learned how controlling he was? Had she learned exactly how he was going to react to everything? And she gave him an offer that she knew he wouldn't take. So then at least she could say, I offered to work on this marriage. Now I'm walking away because you don't want to. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's never been said like that, but I, I just thought to myself, I wonder, I wonder if she, you know, I wonder if she had grown up that much and realised, or, I mean, if that's what she was thinking, God knows what she would have done if it had said, yeah, all right. <laughs> but, yeah, so, no, but anyway, he didn't say yes. He wanted to stay where he was, seeing who he was seeing. And you keep going to work and don't you dare see anybody because you've just got to keep me. And that's how it works for Paul. After her home visit in Vancouver and saying goodbye to her mum, Dorothy returned to New York to carry on filming. They all laughed. Paul Snyder went back to LA. <laughs> what I don't know what he was going back to LA for, but yeah, that to him, that was where he lived. So he went back there to their apartment because... He hadn't accepted this offer. She decided, well, Paul was carried on ringing her in New York. By this time, she'd stopped answering his calls. She decided that enough was enough. He's going to get the message one way or another. So she was just ignoring his calls and they continued and they came thick and fast. In the end, she sent him another letter. Now, this next letter told him that it was over, both physically and financially. Paul Snyder was not happy with this. What's the first thing that he did? All the presents that she'd got for winning Playmate of the Year 1979, one of which was a £26,000 Jaguar, he sold. He sold everything. It was his way or his way. There was no conversations. There was nothing. It's you do this to me, I'll do this to you. It's as though he always had to go one better. There was no compromise. It was, I'll punish you. And so that's what he did. And again, he put all that money in his bank account. He also emptied their joint bank account. And this is another thing Dorothy still trusting. They had a joint bank account. She never thought for a minute that he was going to go to this bank account and do, do anything with the money. But he did. He emptied the lot and he put everything from up the jewellery or the prizes she'd won, 
all the money from her their joint bank account. He put it all in his bank account. So as time went on, obviously Paul Snyder waded his way through all this money that he'd taken, of everything that he'd sold of Dorothy's, the money out of the bank account, and he decided that he needed to get another paycheck. There was no way he was going to go back to Canada. I don't know why he wouldn't go back to Canada. I believe Canada's lovely. My subscribers from Canada are lovely. I'd love to go to Canada. Anyway, he wasn't going back. So he needed his next paycheck. So he decides that what he's going to do is he's going to dig into Dorothy's ribs for a good divorce settlement. He decided he needed to prove that she was having an affair with this Peter Bogdanovich. So he hires a detective to go to New York and watch and get all the evidence that he needs. Now, it doesn't look like this detective got much, but by mid-July 1980, the filming for They All Laughed had finished. At the end of filming, Dorothy and Peter Bogdanovich, they decide to take a two-week trip to London together. Obviously, they had to head back to LA, which they did. But because Dorothy wanted to avoid Paul Snyder, she rented her, an apartment for herself. Now, she did this for two reasons. She wasn't going to stay there. She was going to stay with Peter Bogdanovich. But she needed this address for Paul Snyder. And also for, for work. She was living with Peter in his Bel Air home. So while back in LA, Dorothy did meet up with Paul Snyder a couple of times to try and work out a good divorce settlement that she was willing to pay. So he meets up with Dorothy, as I said, a couple of times, but they don't really get anything settled. He carries on trying to phone her. He starts writing her love songs a bit late, really, for that. He realised by this time that he, Dorothy had checked out. There was no hope. So he'd gone to this dark place and then he'd become angry and then he went to a whole new level. He borrowed a point thirty eight from a friend and he went to Bogdanovich's house and decided to like camp outside and it said that he had said he was the first person that came out of there, which I understand meant whether it was Peter or whether it was Dorothy. The first one to walk out was going to be shot. Fortunate for them, at that time, none of them did come out. And he camped out and all the rest of it. Anyway, nothing happened. So we went back home. The next day, this friend asked for the back. I mean, it's at that stage, really, that that friend, he must have known, should have reported and said what he was going to do. Paul Snyder then decided to go back to plan A. -A. So he decided he was going to woo Dorothy back. He was going to be good guy again. So he set up a meeting with Dorothy. Said all the right things. Well, he didn't actually said all the wrong things, obviously, because she wasn't having any go. But he thought he was saying all the right things. But it was at this meeting that Dorothy actually told Paul that she'd fallen in love with Peter Bogdanovich. Well, personally, I, I think she's, she, she was being honest. She was being Dorothy. I know she hadn't told him well before and all that, but it was new. She didn't know where it was going. I think she thought as well, because Paul had asked to meet her and he, he sounded quite calm. I think she thought that that was like an open invitation to put the cards on the table and be really grown up about this. Let's be amicable. I think that's what she thought Paul was doing. However, it was the worst thing she could have said to him. So now Paul was feeling even more dejected and resentful. So he got in touch with his detective friend again and he asked him to go shopping with him to buy a river. Now, I'm not absolutely sure exactly what happened with this, 
because I've actually in my research I came across two different two different things on one on a program it was said that the detective had said no on researching in files online it was said that he did actually go with him but the assistant had worked out that he was buying it for Paul because Paul was Canadian, he couldn't get a license and this assistant caught on to this and refused to sell it. But the next day after that, which was August the 13th, 1980, he'd actually managed again in the classified ads to buy a sh The following day on August the 14th, 1980, Dorothy again agreed to meet up with Paul Snyder to see if they could resolve this settlement once and for all. Now, Hugh Hefner and Peter Bogdanovich had both asked her not to go. She told him in the end that she wouldn't, but she actually did go. They'd arranged to meet at the house, well, at the apartment that they both shared before they split up. Now, by this time, Paul Snyder had two roommates. Well, of course he did. Paul Snyder had said, like, we're gonna try and see if we can sort things out. And he asked them to like go out for the day, uh, which was Patty Lawman and Stephen Kushner, Dr. Stephen Kushner, which they did. When they arrived home later that night, they could see that Dorothy's car was still outside. So obviously they went in pretty quietly and there was nobody around. So they just presumed that they was in the bedroom and dead reconciled. You know, the hours went on and nobody came out of their bedroom. However, they was alerted that night by the detective that Paul Snyder had become friends with. He had a bad feeling and he advised him to just check that everything was fine. At approximately 11pm that night, Patty Lawman and Dr Stephen Kushner opened the door of Paul Snyder's bedroom and there in front of him was the body of Dorothy Stratton and Paul Snyder. Each of them had been killed by a single bullet from Paul Snyder's and both the bodies were on the floor, both nude. It turns out that Paul Snyder had actually Dorothy before shooting her in the face. It's also said he did exactly the same after he'd shot her. And an hour later is when he shot himself. It appears after further investigation that Dorothy Stratton was actually murdered within an hour of going in to see Paul Snyder. And it was an hour later that he actually shot himself. When Hugh Hefner and Peter Bogdanovich found out what had happened, they were both absolutely devastated, particularly Peter Bogdanovich. However, before very long, they both started blaming each other. Hugh Hefner blamed Peter for taking somebody else's wife and Peter Bogdanovich blamed the playmate bunny culture. I mean, he used to frequent his mansion, so yeah, I, I don't understand what that was about. Who they should have been blaming was Paul Snyder. It was Paul Snyder. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine how our mum felt. Or, or a sister and brother. They must have been absolutely devastated. And I believe like Peter Bogdanovich was, yeah, he actually was never really, he went a saint after that. Let me get to that. But I don't think he was actually the same man again after that. He, he absolutely adored Dorothy. That was very, very clear. Dorothy was cremated. Dorothy Stratton was cremated. Incidentally, I, I forgot to say this at the beginning. And as, you, as I did say, her name was Hoog Stratton, but it was changed to Stratton when she became a Playboy Bonnie. Yeah, she was cremated and her remains were interred at uh, Pierce Brothers Westwood Village Memorial Park which apparently is where Marilyn Monroe is as well. Also, when Peter Bogdanovich was younger, he was in acting classes with Marilyn Monroe. 
I just thought it was quite spooky at the end because I just kept thinking about Marilyn Monroe all the way through it. So I was a bit spooked out at the end when I, when I read that. The story should really end there, but it doesn't because Peter Bogdanovich actually went, well, he stayed in close, fam in close contact with Dorothy's family afterwards and they actually moved in with him and he paid for her younger sister's schooling and acting and he, he just paid for everything for them. However, when Louise had reached 20, it, they actually got married. It, it turns out he was having a relationship with her, but they was married for 13 years. And even when they divorced afterwards, they still stayed friends. And I believe they still lived together, even with Dorothy's mother as well. So that, you know, they, they always stayed friends. She actually did become um, an actress herself. And I think she did some directing and producing and that also. There was a lot of accusations about it with regards. He was trying to make her, you know, because she had plastic surgery as well, so he was trying to get her to look more like Dorothy and all this lot. He did say afterwards, though, that he'd never loved anybody like Dorothy, either before or since, which was a, a bit of pie in the face, really, for Louise. But, yeah, it was only actually this year that Peter Bogdanovich died at aged 82 on the 6th of January 2022. So, that's it. Tell me what you think about this one down in the comments below. It's a hard one really, especially about how we ended up with, you know, with Louise. It it does look a bit iffy there, doesn't it? Like he's trying to hang on to Dorothy and everything, but I don't know. But the fact that it, it, his argument was that, that all them, her mother and everything would have been um, his relatives in-laws anyway so that's why he moved them in he's no need to stop seeing them just you know well not just because Dorothy died but because Dorothy died he had no need to move away from them so yeah bit um, I don't know I don't know about that let me let me know in the comments what you what you think about this case I just think it's so sad for her I just wish you that strength that she got when she was 20 i mean you are only going to find that with experience and life you're not you're not going to find that just because you need to you need to go through them things but i just wish she hadn't gone to his house i just wish i just wish that detective or the classified ads would have said we've sold him this or just somebody would have said something or just forbid her to go <laughs> you know kept hold her and said you're not going anywhere but yeah Anyway, let me know what you what let me know what you think on this case. So the other thing is where I've been. Yes. So I know I got messages off a few of you and a few of you know that I, I got COVID. I'd spent a year and a half best part isolating and then even when everything lifted and I started going out, the rule was that I, I couldn't go and see my son or his family and my granddaughter for five days. If it'd been out the night before, I couldn't go for five days. I was fine with that. Their rules stuck by it. Guess who gave me COVID? After nearly a year and a half, two years of doing that. Them two. I wasn't happy. Anyway, I love them to bits, so I forgave him very quickly. But yeah, so that's where I was. Yeah, me, me, me voice was all off. I am sorry, and I promise you I am back now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I tried out a new camera as well for one week while I was sat on the couch poorly. <sighs> right over the head. That's going back. I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. So if any of you know a really easy camera I can buy, 4K camera, comments below. Cheers. Anyway, I'm going to sign off. And as I say, stay safe, good night, and come back. Love ya. Bye.